Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today for our workshop called Decolonizing Our Thinking and Actions. Um, the speak, guest speakers today are um, Mary Graham, Yin Paradis, and my humble self, and we'll be sharing with you um, some insights into this really interesting, contentious, controversial, and often painful topic of um, decolonizing. Um, yes, this is being recorded, and the recording will be made available to everyone who registered, um, and eventually it will be on the website for everybody else as well. So first I'd like to share screen and tell you about our workshop and acknowledge country. So please bear with me as I um, play with my buttons. Cool, that one is actually what I'll get to in a moment. While I'm here, um, I might just give a quick plug to this particular web page while my computer has frozen on this page. Um, it's demanding that I tell you that on this web page, greenprints.org.au events, you will see not only this important workshop, but many others coming through over the coming months as um, Ayla and the Green Prints program shares with you um, a range of provocative and important discussions with guest speakers from around Australia. I'm going to try that share screen again so I can get to where I really need to be. So, so firstly, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, I am Dr. Michelle Maloney, uh, co-founder and national convener of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. I'm also really privileged to be um, one of the directors of Future Dreaming Australia, which I will take a moment to tell you all about in a moment. But today our workshop goes from 12 to 2. Um, with our wonderful speakers and um, we'll kick off in a moment. I'd like to acknowledge country. I'd like to acknowledge that I live, work and play on the beautiful lands, the traditional lands of the Yagara and Turrbal people here in North Brisbane. I'd like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging and also acknowledge the ongoing history, legacy and current day impacts of colonisation, which is something we're going to talk a lot about today. I did want to take a moment to tell you a bit about the three entities or initiatives that are hosting today's workshop, a little bit of free advertising for what we get up to, and also an invitation to join us in our many endeavours. Um, if my buttons will serve me kindly, I'd like to quickly show you Future Dreaming. Future Dreaming Australia was created by Mary Graham, Ross Williams, both Indigenous elders in their respective communities, myself and Lib Macon, and now James Lee has joined us on the Board of Directors. Future Dreaming Australia is a really wonderful little not-for-profit entity. We're just ramping up. What our goal is, is to share ecological knowledge to build a better future for all of us. Um, the passion with which Ross Williams, Mary Graham, myself, James and others hold this space is really wonderful. And what we've been doing so far, because we launched just before the massive COVID lockdowns, what we've been doing so far is a range of workshops and activities helping people um, learn about Indigenous culture and perspectives, but doing it inside a space where there are also non-Indigenous voices reflecting and critiquing our own systems and um, looking at the good stuff that's going on in the Western traditions as well. And just a, a shameless advertisement, we do have a workshop tomorrow. Um, it starts from 12, 12 to 12.30. It's one of our, we have a couple each year, connecting to place and uh, caring for country. I'd share that with you, but I'll just quickly move through my other promos so you know who we all are. The Australian Earth Laws Alliance, earthlaws.org.au if you want to look us up. Um, I often consider Ayla the mothership, the baby of a lot of my work, including work we've done um, collectively, so many of us, in auspicing the New Economy Network Australia. But Ayla's mission is to help societies or to be part of a contribution to helping societies understand how to shift from human-centred, extractive societies towards um, earth-centred and regenerative societies. We have a particular focus on governance issues inside industrial societies like law, economics, education and others. Um, also, just want a final plug, Ayla has given birth to this gorgeous little initiative called Green Prince, which I won't talk too much about today, but Green Prince is hosting the Green Prince Exchange workshop series. So many good things will be popping up out of Green Prince. Um, but right now, um, I might start to introduce our workshop and um, hand over to Yin in a moment. Um, so in our workshop today, what we'd like to do 
is I'm going to hand over to Yin Paradis, who is a professor of race relations at Deakin University, but I will let him introduce you, introduce himself to you the proper way, his own way. Um, and Yin will speak with us for about 20, 25 minutes or a little bit over um, on the ideas around decolonizing, challenging modernity, and so much more. And I find every time Yin speaks, my mind is blown open a little bit more, and I absolutely love it. So brace yourselves for some really excellent thinking and, and provocations from Yin. And then we'll hand over to Mary, um, who I see she's joining us now, which is wonderful. Um, Mary Graham will then take a moment to reflect on the Indigenous worldview, Indigenous philosophies, the logic, and the remarkable rationale behind many of the governance structures that Aboriginal societies did have and continue to have post um, colonization. Um, she also talks in great depth about the relationist ethos and with both Yin and Mary, it is such a privilege to have their wisdom and knowledge today. And I urge you to Google them and look up their other work, recordings, writings, etc. Um, please stay on for my talk, although I am no, not in, in uh, their league for provocation. What I'd like to do is through uh, the lens of a non-Indigenous person, reflect back the, the journey from ignorance in terms of Western education about this continent, our history, our systems of thinking, my personal journey through that ignorance into learning, unlearning and learning again, um, different ways of thinking and being, and hopefully um, inspire folks who perhaps like me um, are non-Indigenous but love this country and really want to play their part um, in decolonizing their thinking and actions. So without further ado, I mean, we'll have a good half an hour, 35 minutes for questions and discussion. If you have questions, just because we've got quite a lot of us on, we've got nearly 200 people, um, it would be lovely if you could do the following. You're very welcome to chat throughout the whole time, but if you want to put a question to us in the question moment, um, question session, it might be good if you pop that in closer to 1.30. It's just that I may lose it. I try to keep track of things and so do my lovely colleagues, James and Christina. Um, but yeah, if you've got a question, you might be better off just jotting it down. Pop it in. So I'm going to stop sharing. And just a reminder, please do keep yourself on mute. I can see a few folks there who are not on mute um, and we'll keep letting folks in as we go. Um, and Mary, welcome. I think I can see you there. Yes. How are you, Hello. How are you? Yeah, lovely to yeah, see you. Yeah, sorry, I'm late. I'm, the internet's a bit unstable, it says. So well, I, don't I know. think it could be these horrific storms we're all experiencing. I think so too, yeah. Yeah. Mm. But no, it's lovely to see you, Mary. I have to admit, my heart skips a beat when you're not there when we start, but I know you were coming. <laughs> I am on my way. <laughs> <laughs> lovely. So as we discussed, Mary, um, Yin will kick off and, um, yes. and then we'll... we'll, we'll basically save questions till the end so we can have a rich discussion rather than have anyone lose time. So, okay, enough from me. Um, Yin, I'm going to put you on spotlight. Lucky you. Welcome, Yin. How are you today? Hello, Michelle. Uh, I'm a little disappointed that I wasn't later than Mary today. <laughs> um, I'm yes. usually the most late. Uh, and I'm going to have to be better next time. I'll remember that next time I host you, Yin, because you have given me a heart attack in the past. So, yes. <laughs> all right, Yin, well, look, if you, I've introduced you very briefly, but if you'd like to share your story with folks, we're all ears. Can't wait to hear. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Uh, I'm Yin Paradis. I'm a Wakaya man from the Gulf country is where my mob um, originate from near the NT Queensland border where my grandmother was born. And uh, I myself was born in Townsville and grew up in Darwin and have since moved to Melbourne. I've been in Melbourne for the greater Melbourne area, various spots for oh, 15 years or so now. And uh, I'm a professor of race relations at Deakin University. And I'm mostly, I'm most interested in decolonization and indigenous knowledges which is why I'm gonna share my screen now and start talking about decolonization. I'll leave some more of the indigenous knowledges to Mary, but let's do some decolonizing talk. So we're here to talk about uh, thinking in actions, apparently, and decolonizing them, among other things. I think we'll add some things to that list. I think thinking is a little bit too central uh, to colonial mentalities. So we need to worldviews, world senses, existence scapes. We need to do more than think. We need to think in different ways. 
Let's talk about colonization first. This is every country that Britain has invaded, not the ones in white. Although yesterday, someone from Bolivia told me that that should also be pink. So I'd like to keep some white in the image, but it's, it's look, not looking good for that. So that's what colonization looks, that's the reality of colonization. That's, I mean, it speaks for itself. And this is the result of that. Uh, we have 60% of people globally, globally earning less than $5 a day. A 60% decline in vertebrate numbers since 1970. Eight men are wealthier than half the world's population. The poorest half, of course. Maybe less than eight now, could be six. I haven't checked recently. 1.6 billion people are without adequate housing. A quarter of children worldwide are malnourished. And we've seen the longest consecutive declines in life expectancy in the United States in a century with similar trends in the UK. You could, you could do this about Australia if you wanted to as well. For example, at the moment, we have the highest imprisonment rate in Australia for the last 100 years. Just one example. Of course, if we look at other issues, what I like to call global health, when people talk about global health, they mean people, how well are people going? Um, there's more to the globe, there's more to the world than people. Halving of vegetation biomass in the past 11,000 years, which is about the length of time that the conditions for colonialism have emerged. They emerged about, let's say, 10,000 years ago and have been growing ever since. Two thirds of land surface altered by humans. As I said, vertebrates are down, wetlands are being destroyed, blah, blah, blah. You know the story. We're in the midst of the sixth mass, a, what they call the sixth mass extinction, probably more like the seventh, but let's go with sixth. And it's not getting any better. We've got a lot of policy. You might have heard of policy. We have those things, but no action has really emerged from the policy. So we're rapidly heading to the collapse of this particular civilization, this particular, what I call modernity, sometime in this century. I'm not going to be all Nostradamus about it, but definitely by the end of the century, we'll be done with the configuration of societies that we currently have. And here we have uh, a graphic of that, which really sums it up quite well. Uh, hands up anyone who's ever heard the song, Everything is Awesome from the famous Lego movie. We don't have hands, do we? Oh, there, someone did. Someone raised their hands. Oh, yeah, three people know the Lego movie. It's a great movie. Well, this is what we're doing. That's what modernity, the motto, the slogan of modernity is everything is awesome. And there's a song that goes with that, which I'm not going to sing. And you could say we've never been healthier, happier, wealthier, if you wanted to. I mean, it's profoundly inaccurate, but that's what we're talking about here. We have science, democracy, rights, education, modern medicine. We live longer, which is not really true either. People in Africa have mobile phones and washing machines. That is true. We need to protect our way of life and get the rest of the world on board. No, definitely wrong. But this is the story. And then around the story, we have some small issues. Um, mental health crisis, completely unimaginable dimensions. Might have noticed petrol prices have gone up. Might have noticed something called COVID, um, food, water insecurity, underemployment, the unnecessary, the precariousness of everything, housing, resources. But more than that, relationships. The damage done to relationships in modernity is uh, beyond comprehension. So what, is, what are the societal dimensions of modernity anyway? What, are we, what does this modernity thing actually mean? Well, it's a culture. It's a particular culture to do with coloniality, patriarchy, capitalism. And here are some of the dimensions of it. Separatism, we'll mention that a lot because it's very important. The idea of individuals at all is highly dubious. And it's a, a sense of really undermining or silencing or ignoring or eliding interdependence, the spiritual, the sacred, the intuitive, the holy, ritual, ceremony, tradition. Uh, these are not well 
respected and valued in modernity. Time is a linear, monetarized, equally distributed, chronically deficient quantity, according to the Western, modern, modernist worldviews. We can save, spend, squeeze, waste time, perform on time, be time poor, rich. But what if we thought of time not as a commodity, not as linear, as something else? There's a focus on self-improvement. Everyone is responsible for how their life turns out, more or less, while also needing to do as they're told by the powers that be. Failure and success are attributed to individuals, their deficiencies, their talents, their decisions. And there's really very little understanding or comprehension of our embeddedness, embeddedness in social contexts and how that shapes our lives. Oops, not ready for that yet. Back up. So universalism is another one. A bit hard to describe, but basically, you know, there's only one way of understanding things and that's universal, essentially. Competition, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a cultural norm. I wouldn't say that it's intrinsic to capitalism, but it certainly seems to be getting around in terms of how people relate to each other. Access to societal resources and achievements is ostensibly based on the very strange concepts of merit and worthiness. Okay, so the deeper myths of modernity. This is what we're dealing with. To understand colonization before we can decolonize. Separation from ourselves, other, so within ourselves, we compartmentalize. We don't connect with our expansive capaciousness of ourselves from other people, beings, land, sea, and air, what sometimes is called country by Aboriginal people. Denial of interdependence and vulnerability. An unrestricted autonomy as a in contrast to a relational autonomy or what Mary would call autonomous regard. Entitlement, merit, innocence, denying complicity in the harm, violence, and exploitation of modernity. Unceasing growth, progress, development, accumulation, consumption, and waste on a finite planet. Certainty, surety, mastery, and control that offer simplistic solutions to complex predicaments that deny the tremendous challenges we collectively face. And the malaises of modernity are these, artificial scarcity and demand, profit, accumulation, hierarchy, individualism, a, a sort of competitive individualism, exploitation, co-modification, of everything. That's why we have human resources and natural resources because they're not just trees and people, they have to be co-modified. Comparison, judgment, condemnation, alienation, huge, huge problem in our culture. Cynicism, craving, fear, anxiety, guilt, shame, greed, also problems. Control, conformity, coercion, compliance, cruelty are the basis of how things are done generally. Purity, protagonism, progress, protest, and popularity. These are the conditions, if, if you will, of modernity now. What I sometimes call malaises because it sounds better where there's two M's. Could be conditions of modernity, but I like malaises. All right, so decolonizing via conscious, that's important, thinking, feeling, being, and doing. So thinking is there, but there's more things. Doing is there, action, but being, becoming, feeling. Feelings are incredibly important and not paid enough attention to. So uh, Michelle asked me to add this slide to emphasize there's a difference between decolonization and indigenization. So they're related terms, but they're not the same. So basically to decolonize is to, to go somewhere entirely new, to embrace um, alternative, otherwise cosmologies for how societies and cultures are constituted. It doesn't mean you go back and do everything that Indigenous people used to do or do what Indigenous people do now. It's, it's complex. It's, it's not, they're not the same thing. So to remove the oppressive influence of colonialism is very important and that opens up a very wide, wide range of potential and possible futures. Some of those are related to varying degrees to existing and past Indigenous cultures, while others are entirely new, invented and felt futures. So decolonization and indigenization are not synonymous. Colonization and indigenization are not opposites. It's more complex than simple binary oppositional dichotomies. 
Okay, this is really important, uh, but very difficult to wrap your mind in particular around. So to decolonize is to radically re-understand, to comprehend the universe in a very different way. Here we have a picture of a brain and we have around, you can't possibly read this unless you get really close to the screen, I'm not going to do that. Uh, all the cognitive biases that, you know, psychologists have identified. They're good at that sort of thing, biases. Now, think about it for a second. If there's so many biases, we are so deeply affected by our environments where these biases emerge, then why is our brain in the center of this diagram? Why do we have this impression that we think with our brains? Well, that thinking is something that occurs within our body exclusively in a very bounded, separate, individual, isolated way. What if we think these are not really biases anymore? Actually, there are no such thing as biases really because we don't have independent thought. We think by, with, and via our environments. We're not separate, framed, isolated, insulated, distinct entities. We're actually membranic fields in relational flux. Membranes are things that are porous, that allow much more openness to the rest of existence. And we are always in relation to the rest of existence. It is constituting us constantly. We're not separate. We're distributed, we're diffused, we're diffracted, unfurling membranic field events. You can think of it as knots on a string. If you look at a knot on a string, you might think, oh, that's, a, that's separate from the string. Looks, looks like it's separate. You could like, maybe you could pull that thing off, that other thing. But no, knots are part of strings and we are part of, we have knots on the many strings of existence. So, and the, and the most important message to take home from that is relationships are fundamental to existence. All of existence is just relational flows. And any things, forms that emerge from that are temporary, relative, uh, and contingent. So it's a reality flux that is constitutively incomplete ineluctably contingent, fleeting, provisional, suffused with unpredictability, untraceability, unindexability, insequentiality, irreversibility, and irreducibility. Relationships are foundational. Things are epiphenomenal. They're just sort of secondary. So things are not very real. Now, colonization and westernization is all about thingifying the universe. There's so many nouns in English. There's definite articles, there's all this kind of certainty, fixedness, thingification that creates really big issues with the way we think, feel, do and become. So experience is panjective. It's not subjective or objective. It's some sort of metaphorical mix of those that you can't literally define. And to sum it up quite simply, reality is a blended continuum in which there can be no essential or absolute difference between me and the rest of the universe at any time or place. It's that simple. So flowing from that foundational understanding, you get things like this, decolonial perspectives. Nothing is complete, perfect or enduring, but all is alive, sentient, profoundly relational and deeply sacred. We are immersed in mysterious worlds which we can learn to perceive, inhabit, co-mingle and grow with. We are invited to outgrow the often unquestioned obligation to obey, conform, judge and repress, which stunts our ability to express, create, connect and play. We are called to conscious, embodied, loving, reverent co-liberation with each other within the spontaneous, emergent, complex, self-organizing living cosmos. Now, practically, what would it look like to become decolonial? What would you not have? What would you disinvest or divest from? 
some examples. Debt, private property, institutions and nation states would have to go so that we can overcome alienation from ourselves, others, our socio-material conditions and so-called nature, which we are obviously part of. We'd have to unlearn reductionism, truth, rightness, power over, ambition, affirmation, success, perfection, certainty, control, coherence, mastery, progress, virtue, fame, validation, heroism, merit, entitlement, duty, and sacrifice. And explore ways of becoming, relating, and perceiving that create a life beyond exceptionalism, exploitation, extraction, consumption, and growth at a high level, and human hubris. So this means tapping into the immense joy of forgetting who and what we think we are because we're not and instead sensing the gift of not only being what we imagine ourselves to be that's decolonizing ourselves in a nutshell of course there's societal decolonization which follows from the way that we interact with the world the way that we relate to the world the way that we form communities the way that we form collectives and it would be going from the extractive economy to the regenerative economy so you know it's all the stuff that you don't want militarization enclosure of wealth and power exploitation etc and you go through a values filter soil in this case you stop supporting the, the bad system you divest from the power of the bad you starve and stop and you grow you seed something new you feed it you nourish it and you draw down, it's really important, you draw down power, you draw down resources to the local where humans are meant to live in localized communities. And you end up, if it works out, with a regenerative society, if you want, which is about cooperation, well-being, caring and sacredness and participatory, deep participatory democracy. Simple, will happen eventually. But, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a rocky road to get there. You can sense global patterns, enact local responses. So seek a grateful, humble, ethical life that tunes in, heals, and creates radical abundance for yourself, others, and all life, where our indicates belonging, not ownership. As I said, you can starve or stop or somehow disinvest from the system we have, interrupt, block, boycott, embargo, spam, jam, snap, obstruct, protest, refuse, stall, and starve modernity. You can, of course, do the whole reduce, repair, reuse, recycle thing. And, and really the point of that is to close loops. So to close loops at a small level, local loops, where you can see the whole loop. You know, it's not that hard to see where your resources that sustain you are coming from and where they're going and how that's regenerative within a kind of expanded commons. Abolish stock labor markets, commercial compound interest, banking of most sorts, subsidies, advertising, commercial advertising, planned obsolescence, which makes us use 60% more mobile phones than we need to, tax breaks, havens, shell companies, and redundant trade, which is ridiculous. You know, why would you export 1,000 tonnes of tomatoes in order to import 1,000 tonnes of tomatoes from somewhere else? It's, it's capitalism, which is fundamentally ridiculous. Foster communities, localised communities, through volunteering, mentoring, skill sharing, time banking, donating, and, and basically participating in life. You know, this is about connecting, relating, and participating. Mutual aid networks, cooperatives, commons, focused on things like sustenance, healing, caring, provisioning, entertaining, learning, creating together. Abolish debt, money, private property, as I said, but not personal possessions. Hierarchical, oppressive organizations, which are called institutions, and the nation states, which, which are institutions of institutions reject the ideal of competitive success of being a consumptive spectator of your own life think about how much you consume and how much you participate in okay Con participating means you're engaging with other life in some way consuming means you're just experiencing something that someone else created for the purposes of you to consume live wildly in frugal simple sufficient joyful pleasure and how, the thing is that decolonization is a process oriented kind of activity. So it's kind of like, you know, people might say the means justifies the ends. Well, it doesn't, it never does. In a prefigurative politics and decolonial politics, the means are the ends. The actions you take shape the person you are becoming 
all the time. So the means are the ends. So the means are very important. And there's process oriented principles like these create circles, not lines, practice deep listening, plan with people, don't represent them, move at the speed of trust, center lived experience, seek people at the margins. These are ways of acting. Doesn't matter what the outcome is that you're trying to achieve, doesn't matter if you're not trying to achieve any outcome. Process is much more important than outcomes. What would happen if we stopped trying to solve global problems by scaling up standardized solutions? What would it mean to accept ourselves unconditionally exactly as we are while staying wide open to growth? How can we invite material conditions and social relations which are conduct conducive to life, beauty, and thriving? How can we live with dignity, love, courage, and truth while opening our hearts to those whose views and actions we profoundly object to? Is it possible to enjoy life's resonances, vibrations, textures, essences, and emanations as we deepen our vulnerability to the suffering in, of, through, via, and with the world? Last few slides towards healthy societies. What if we invite... What about if we invited self-realization, needs, freedom, celebration, interdependence, care, love, connection, beauty, grief, and cooperation without institutionalized exploitative hierarchical institutions hoarding resources produced by the labor imagination and creativity of others weave tapestries of empowered local cooperative communities grounded in the politics of anarchy degrowth wilding unschooling permaculture decolonization myth ritual ceremony tradition prayer that inspire Authentic, thriving, playful, vivid, visceral, plural, messy, vulnerable, sacred, sensuous, joyful, sensible lives. What if we embrace active receptivity to appetites, thoughts, feelings, emotions, moods, desires, sensations, yearnings, longings, yieldings, callings, instincts, hunches, inklings, and needs? What would happen if we offered ourselves in full to the world as it is, without demanding acceptance, acting interdependently in ways that nourish life? while being attentive to your limits and capacities within any given time and place? Could we meet others with curiosity, courage, vulnerability, love, honesty, and humility? Sense visceral needs behind actions, learn and grow with gratitude, connection and cultivation, while minimizing correction, contraction. Attend to beauty even in dire and deeply violated contexts. Could we find our way to a mature society where we slow, pause, breathe, Rest, sleep, idle, lull, and catalyze, channel, doula, delve, guide, receive the unknowable, the unexpected, the uncomfortable, the uncertain, the unthinkable, and even the imperceptible. What happens if we make unique mistakes in doing what is needed with maturity, sobriety, and serenity beyond consumption, comfort, convenience, choice, conviction, or complaint? metabolize, integrate our own assumptions, aversions, addictions, habits, guises, disguises, triggers, complicities, contradictions, projections, traumas, idealizations, and other ossified dichotomies. Could we learn to discern, perceive, relate, communicate, become without necessarily utilizing things like judgment, comparison, justification, condemnation, narrative, meaning, interpretation, or intellectualization? Some more details in this paper, if you're interested. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yin. I'm hoping that you're all feeling the wonder of all of those ideas as much as I am. And I love hearing Yin speak, particularly this one line wraps up for me what Yin talks about, which is this immense joy in forgetting who we think we are. And this is certainly something that I think is very powerful for those of us from the Western tradition, shaking off all of those ideas that Yin talked about that dominate us every day that cause so much stress and return to being a joyful entity, um, a living member of the earth community, et cetera. I'm sure you've got your own thoughts. There's some lovely comments coming through. Um, we will come back at the end to discussing where to get some more resources and how to ask questions and all of that. Um, but right now, I'm just going to say thank you to Yin. Um, give you all a minute to just sit with some of the thoughts, maybe jot down some of the, the points that he made or things that resonated with you. 
And in a minute, um, I'll introduce Mary to then build into this deeper analysis of what it means to decolonize by saying, hey, there's a whole nother world out there, a completely different way of thinking compared to what some of us in the Western tradition are used to. So Yin, to your great relief, I'm sure, I'm gonna take the spotlight off you now. And I will um, put the spotlight on the lovely Mary. All right, hello, Mary Graham, how are you? Hello, today? how are you? <laughs> how are you? It's so lovely for you to be with mm -hmm. us. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, our session today will have, um, I gave an introduction, also giving a good plug to Future Dreaming and the work that you and I and Ross Williams and James and others do together, Mary. But if you would now like to introduce mm. yourself and share with us your insights, um, you know, reflecting back on what Yin has said, but to mm -hmm. tell us a bit about the work you do in helping the rest of us understand the relationist ethos and in the Indigenous logic. Um, thank you so much. Mm. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Yin. That was wonderful, fantastic. Oh, gee, if ever there was a, a guidebook, <laughs> if you want to write a guide, a, li a literal guidebook, go, go and flog it to everybody. <laughs> that, that would be wonderful. A step by step, you know, great way of, um, uh, a wonderful way of um, uh, letting people know or advise people how to actually do it because it's a very complex thing, isn't it? You know, um, colonialism and imperialism and so on. Very, very complex. Um, so I'll introduce myself first. Uh, Mary Graham, I was born in Brisbane, but I grew up in my father's people's area down here on the Gold Coast. Um, you can be a language speaking people. Um, on my mother's side, uh, Waka Waka from the um, about three or 400 miles north west of Brisbane. Um, she was born on a station, but she grew up um, on her young life was on um, Sherberg, uh, which was a reserve. So she was under the act, as they say in about Queensland. My father wasn't under the act. When he married, when they married, he had to get permission to take her away, to marry first of all, and then to take her away back down here to uh, his place. So I've got lots of relatives around South East Queensland and so on. And I've got, um, um, oh gee, um, I had, I should say, a large immediate family, most of whom have passed on my, all uh, a lot of brothers. Um, and I have a talented um, son, John, who's a published writer and um, poet. Um, how, uh, I guess how I'll start, how I could start off is uh, what I call a, a conventional way. Um, I suppose what I do is go back a lot about how, from an Aboriginal, it seems like what I learned from an Aboriginal point of view, our uh, perspective of how human um, nature is, has developed. So very, very conventionally. And I suppose you could argue, you know, quite a Western science sort of point of view about human migration into this country from that um, Africa from that uh, continent, even though older Aboriginal people say we haven't come from anywhere else, we come from this place here. Yeah, this is quite right. Um, but apparently, according to the science and the anthropology, is that humans, um, the people who became Aboriginal, left that continent in the first wave. There were waves of human migration across, out, and through the whole world. Um, coming from um, up to, to the north, round north to the other side of the world, down through, um, first of all, through um, the Americas, to the Americas, and then through what became Asia and so on. And the other thing to keep in mind is what, what actually makes um, humans realise that they're human. This is physical, the physical, physicality of it all, I guess. Um, and, and that is um, reflectivity. And the way they look, the science looks at the examples or evidence of reflectivity is um, burial sites and um, uh, art, um, representation. I mean, all art, ancient and modern, is representation of some sort. And I'm talking about uh, actual representation of humans, um, non-humans, you know, other um, flora and fauna and so on. 
and other spirit looking figures, other figures that you don't know quite what they are, who they are and so on. But they are represented on stone walls and caves and so on and so on. So reflectivity, we're, we, be, we become not just physical, we're, we're physical beings and we're spiritual beings. So we're physical beings. And then when reflectivity comes into it is developed, is actually developed over ages of time, you know, you know, really long, we talk about in half a million to a million years old and so on. Um, uh, that's, that's when people realize um, that uh, life and death, uh, how they're connected and, and so on. In the old, apparently the old science says, when people uh, experience death, somebody died, either sickness or um, fighting or wild animals or whatever, uh, they gathered together and then just moved on. They didn't note it. When they start to note it and have burial sites, that's because the reflectiveness, reflectivity comes in, has come in to their realization about who and what they are and so on and so on. And we have, um, here the most wonderful um stories uh, dreaming stories about how that actually happens actually so um so you have to have both so the idea again the anthropology says that all the whole lot of continents are joined up so moving from continent to continent is you know people walk into other places and apparently they could have walked into this place and the science says that uh, the research science says coming in and around the country and gradually populating the center, you know, and so on and so on. Um, I know there are other schools of thought about, um, and this is the conventional one. This is why I say I start off with the conventional, but whether people are physically human and or, or, or um, sorry, and or reflective human beings, they know the difference. They know the difference uh, between um, other human and other, other than human um, is another thing. So. People walk into the country, populate the country. Um, extra research has found apparently in um, South America, South, South America, South Australia, um, in the um, Adelaide Museum, which was already the very old uh, go-to place for anthropologists, historians, all kinds of people who are, want to study the, the country and the people, the native peoples in inverted commas, uh, they want to study them. Um, they found some material, hair material, that was lost in the museum from a very long time ago. And at that time, apparently, it was already very old, very old. Um, and then they lost it <laughs> in the museum and then recently found it again. They did up-to-date dating on it and found it was about 60, I think 50 to 60,000 years, something around that. Um, uh, 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 this hair material, strands of hair, they um, uh, studied it, um, uh, sorry, compared it with the people who live around the Adelaide area. I can't think of their name, I should know, Kerner, Kerner I think, um, and found that the DNA is the same people. So the people in that place, they've been there for all that time, for that long period of time. Um, and that also says um, something about um, what that infers. It infers that everybody has been in the country and all the, if everybody's familiar with the Aboriginal language map, I guess, seeing all those different parts, they've all been, people have been in these regions for well over around 50, 60, 70, 80,000 years, whatever, whatever. It's not exactly the same time as wasn't a clock at the time, um, but yeah, that they've been in these places for, for a long, long period of time. So um, the, the inference then is um, what kind of, um, the, the, the kind of social and political ordering that took place here. So just imagine, just imagine it's, um, it really is like the old story of being marooned on a desert island, <laughs> you know, and it's smaller than a great continent, of course, like, like Australia. Uh, it's an island continent. They didn't have to go through like other continents all over that world. They didn't have to deal with people other than themselves, different kinds of people, I should say. Uh, even though there's two different kinds of people here, of course, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, you know, to the far north in Queensland. Um, so those other places, they had to deal with all kinds of things like 
over thousands of years, famine, wars, battles with other people who wanted to take over their country, uh, displacement of big populations. So somebody, one mob of people invade this other completely different mob of people, pushes them, dislocates them. They have to move. Um, they displace other people. So people are used to, in all these other areas, invasion. This, this place has never been invaded not for tens of thousands of years. So the idea of invasion is a foreign concept, completely foreign. It doesn't seem to be, it's uh, in a, a, a word or a term for it in Aboriginal languages. There is a terms for every other kind of conflict you can think of, though we did. It's not, people want to say it's a peaceful place. <laughs> it wasn't, <laughs> I mean, it is peaceful. Uh, I, sorry, I'd rather say stable myself. There's a difference between peaceful and stable, um, I think. Um, a very stable place. So uh, the, the, the activity of people invading other people um, is just simply wasn't present. You didn't have to. And when you look at that map, that tells you that. What it's telling you is not just that it's all these different languages, it's showing you a, um, a, politic, a social and political um, ordering system. That's what it's actually showing you, how it all was sorted out. And not from the idea of something like a state with a small s, nothing like a, a unit of coercive, cruel force, forcing people to live in a certain way. That never happened here either. So no hierarchy, but a flat system, a flat system that tells people, told people um, uh, how to live with each other, basically. So you could, in the languages, uh, there are words for, even in our language, you can bear language here on the Gold Coast, um, word for war, battle, words for um, conflict, fight, kill, murder, and so on. Every different word to do with conflict is in the language, all except invasion. And that's the classic invasion, invade, conquest, subjugate. It's absolutely nothing. It's a foreign concept. And while it sounds wonderful, I mean, it is a sort of wonderful thing, um, uh, it, it didn't prepare us. It didn't prepare us for an actual invasion. It, it's such a foreign concept, they didn't know what was happening at first. <laughs> because the idea of somebody coming in and taking over your land was just um, um, unbelievable. You know, it was in, you know, uh, weird. So, have to um, the social and political ordering system um, turns out to be based on relationalism. So uh, there are, and there are wonderful stories about how the land, upon reflecting of reflectivity, the land, and this is this is why it is a uh, um, you become human only in this country because you are fully reflective. You are fully reflective. Um, that's why there's no monkey dreaming or elephant dreaming or anything like that. They're dreaming stories, dreaming stories, um, and creative narratives, if you like, or Genesis, only about the, all the flora and fauna, insects, every living thing is in this country. So that's why they say we didn't come from any other place. We didn't, we came from here. That is the human, human being comes from here. It may, in their own words, this is the country which grew us up, they say. They'll, you'll hear old people say it grew us up, meaning it invented us. It grew us up in that way, you know. So, and it the thing is, it continued, continued, and continues right now to grow us up to keep us going, because obviously it doesn't need us. We can disappear tomorrow, and everything would go go on, you know, without us, without humans. I mean, um, and also if we didn't have land, we'd be floating in space, wouldn't we? <laughs> we'd be, you know, floating around. Um, so. It, it, what, what emerges out of it is a great reciprocal relationship. It goes like uh, this, um, you know, it, it, it looks out, it invents us, creates us. It looks after us. It tells us who, who we are, actually. Um, it continues to look after us. And eventually this reciprocal relationship emerges where because it's looking after us and has invented us, we're obliged forever to look after it in the best possible way to live with it not against it or on top of it or anything like that so a, a relationalist view comes into being 
Um, you can call it all kinds of things, uh, a custodial ethic, I suppose, or just plain reciprocity. Um, you could call it what I've been uh, inclined to call it a, a sacralized ecological collaborative um, stewardship system. So it's not religious and it's not ideological, it's a worldview, more to do with a worldview. Um, so it's very plain, very straightforward. Um, it helps to have this kind of idea of that, uh, you know, the, uh, and we know from all around the world that the, the land as mother, you know, mother nature, talk it, say what you will about it. It's a global thing. But here is an old system, a society of great age that put a, um, a structure and a system uh, together that was like based on that, actually based on it. So um, the political and social ordering system followed this kind of essential relationalism uh, and the uh, relationalism in, in context with survivalism. So relationalism and survivalism are just two things that are entangled together. They are entangled. It's not either or, it's not an excluded middle kind of approach at all. It's, it's entangled and the relationalist um, is everything. It's familial, community, uh, land, land and people, and so on. Survivalism is just straightforward for survivalism. In the large, in the small sense, you've got to be careful crossing the road, you might get hit by a bus. You've got to be careful what you eat, you know, whether it's a thousand years ago or the other week in a restaurant. Um, and it can be, so something small like that or something huge like a war, or a revolution, you are fleeing, your people are fleeing from it, you know, or like colonial systems, um, you know, native peoples running away from being shot, you know, or captured and enslaved and so on and so on. So survivalism in all sorts, but what comes out of it is, out of this straightforward relationalism, is the idea of a relationalist ethos, to have an idea that you, not necessarily a belief system, but a connection with something bigger and broader and deeper outside of the self. And that the biggest, broadest thing, and, the, and, a, and something you can see, of course, not something in, invisible, something that you can see. And of course, the only thing is land. So a relationalist view, a connection with land, and that's a relationalist ethos. So a survivalist ethos though, is if people have been through those various crises, um, individuals, groups, families, communities, um, whole societies, you know, they've been through all of that kind of thing and it's affected them, not everybody, but it's affected them in such a way that what emerges is a survivalist ethos. And a survivalist ethos, you can say in all those common um, sayings, popular sayings nowadays, um, it's a dog eat dog world. The water's full of sharks and you've got to be careful. Look after number one first. Look after yourself as, as against others, your family, your, your town, your group, and so on and so on. You look after them first. So you seek security for, only for yourself and yours at the expense of others. So all it, it works out to be a survivalist ethos is seeing all environments, natural, um, social, political, as always inherently hostile. So you have to arm yourself psychologically, uh, socially, um, economically, of course, um, but also, I mean, straightforward militarily too. You have to arm yourself all the time. The whole of life for those sort of people, those groups, those societies, that's what it always is. It's about that. And survivalism, don't people often, the, the anthropologists, I think this is their fault. <laughs> people talking, uh, they're, they're talking about survivalism as, ah, uh, well, the um, native peoples, survival is the most important thing for native peoples, you know, hunting, all that sort of stuff. But actually, no, the survi real survivalism is, comes into the control of the most powerful and the richest. Survivalism is the most important with that. With, that, with those sort of societies, because they've got everything, you know, already, and they're never going to let any of that go or be shared or have less in order to look after other people's um, security or anything like that. That's the survivalist ethos, as we can see in the world today, you know, because 
mostly indigenous peoples have worked out a whole lot of things they've gone beyond survivalism and and so on you know so um the attributes that i've always seen and i work on this for a while is um of of relationalism relationalist uh, view um uh autonomy we are all autonomous beings i am and you are uh but the nature you know um, the environment is autonomous too it is its own boss and women are definitely definitely the autonomous beings <laughs> they are their own boss they are not meant to be handmaidens or slaves or captives of men or captives of a system you know they run society men's law women's law men's business women's business men's spirituality women's spirituality they're supposed to run things so instead of a hierarchy not a hierarchy uh it's a lateral system or a heterarchy in um, political theory a heterarchy is a flat system and um um so you treat other people with autonomous regard i, I see the meaning of the word regard as being 10 times um the times of um respect respect multiplied 10 times <laughs> regard because regard is a way of looking at looking at as your equal someone else anybody else is your equal you know in in value and worth and so on. and so you you have to follow this concept or way of being of autonomous regard um it's 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 deeper than the the generally understood um or what do you call it um oh heavens um in international law um diplomacy it's deeper and more core than that actually you know so uh autonomy and it also doesn't mean uh, anything like uh strict individual autonomy like um you're a conscious isolate or you are a um discrete entity or you are a law unto yourself i you know and i i've i can just look after myself outside of other people and so on. it's not that kind of autonomy you can't even be or have autonomous regard except with with other people you know others are there so Mary, would you like me to just quickly share the slide? You often share a slide. Oh, yeah. Time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I didn't okay. want to interrupt until now. Um, yeah. No, you sure. Keep talking and I'll just bring so, it up. Okay. So autonomy is one. Uh, the Another attribute is balance, is balance between things. Um, now, obviously, gender balance or um, a balance uh, in governance, a gendered balanced governance, you know, uh, flat and so on. Um, but it's also a case of um, a balance between several things that are problematics in having a um, uh, uh, having a stable society. So the idea, one of the big ones, is um, <clears throat> authority and power. What do human societies do with authority and power? So most ancient states, ancient and modern, of course, they conflate authority and power they conflate it together um so if you have power you have, that gives you the authority to do whatever you like and of course this is what states are for states with the smallest um but um um what aboriginal people did was something quite unique i, I do believe they separated authority and power but on the same level not not one above the other not hierarchical and not not clamped together but separate. I sometimes in my um, imagination or musing, I think of it as like terrible twins, conjoined twins who are joined together and they fight and argue all the time. And the best way to have some peace and quiet and, um, you know, um, better um, relations is if they were separated, they, get, they would get on better um, and uh, more understanding and so on and so on. And it would be better for them and everyone else if well, authority and power were separate. Power is diffused throughout the people, throughout the people of the, the community. And of course, naturally, the people and the authority, they're, in, they're, they're um, related to each other, of course, you know. Um, and you have connections like on the, like on the map, the great map here, um, between, the, between the two. 
So authority and power is within these groups and outside these groups too, also um, um, with other, with, in relation to other groups and so on. So authority, I, I reckon, as constitutes, everybody says the elders, but it is knowledgeable people. I believe it's knowledgeable people because the reality and the very grounded and realistic um, thinking thinkers, Aboriginal people, they understood that not everybody grows wise with age. <laughs> so you have to have people, knowledgeable people who are the, um, you know, the, uh, they have this authority. And of course you have to have young people. You have to have young people. They are knowledgeable people too. But again, the especially the, the young person with an old head on their shoulders you know, that kind of person, the one who wants to know more, um, look, wants to be a custodian, uh, you know, custodian of the land and so on and so on. So you have those people as this knowledgeable people and they don't rule like kings or queens. They don't, um, they can't boss the people around. They are great exemplars for the people. They, they are the authority because they know the stories um, the old stories, they know the rules, they know the land itself. Um, and it's just the sheer experience, of course, of being an older person. And of course, the younger people, um, particularly younger people who want to learn all of this too, and so on. But yes, the, um, you know, there's with power diffused among the people, there's old political sayings of the modern, in modern life of power to the people power for the people. There were all those old fashioned slogans, you know. Well, here's an ancient society that actually put that into, into a structure, into a actual structure of running a country. So you, the, they don't have to obey, obey older people, you know, the, the authority. In fact, it's better not to, don't, don't have an idea of obey, obedience. Um, they, you, the, 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 your ancestors are very important, but you're not necessarily um, obeying your ancestors either, but you are listening and knowing and learning from others um, about what they saw as very important. You know, not, not, uh, you know, not, not following blindly, I should say, not blind following. You know. So you, because as, as I was saying, you know, everybody's an autonomous being, so you can't go around telling people what to do or punishing them if they don't do what they're told and so on and so on. So um, the, the other one is, um, no, I think that's it, between authority and power and between, but in, in other ways too, of course. I always compare it a bit to, um, in our area, I don't know about the rest of the country, but I've heard the same thing in other, other, other people's countries here. Um, that the sun is female and the moon is male. And the sun and the moon, you know, pure energy wise, the sun is more powerful, far more powerful than the moon, but they both have energy. Um, so they're unequal, but they are placed there. And so they, they are seen to be in balance and they have to remain in balance in order to, for the earth to have a stable life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you, you you see that as a kind of an example or something to follow. You know, hey, Mary, that's the kind of society you have to have. Yeah. As as we start to um, move towards I'm um, sorry, yeah. I'll no, take no, it. gosh. Raving no, on. Never I you Always know end up raving on. I work with um, you all the time and I actually hate interrupting you. Um <laughs> what, I, what I was gonna ask is perhaps we could as a nice segue from your um, talk into my talk is I love when you talk about autonomous regard and remind everyone that it's not just between people, you know, it's mm. this remarkable yes, absolutely. between all beings and all, all forces. beings. Yeah. So you want to just talk a little bit about that and then we'll, we might have a very yes. quick break. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, don't um, be sorry. We could all listen to you for uh, days. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Well, in a, in a sense, it, it comes from the a logic, which I was going to go on to the logic of all perspectives are valid and reasonable. Yes. Actually. You know, it's not Aristotelian logic, either or, either you're a friend of the Americans or you're an enemy. That's the current logic globally, actually. Um, and you're in big trouble if you don't follow uh, uh, any other particular side and so on. Um, so the earth itself has its own, its own view, you know, um, all the, when you see that map, 
yep. all of those people, all of these different areas have their own logic. They all, so it comes out to be that uh, logic, um, it's um, all perspectives are valid and reasonable. And it's a way of sus um, suspending um, judgmentalism. So if you wanted to have a custodian, um, custodial e um, ethos, um, or a, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, I said it before, a stewardship system. You have to do something about judgmentalism. <laughs> so that kind of logic, it's valuable to have a logic like that to um, help with the non-judgmentalism, you know. Um, just really briefly though too, um, technically, um, the, uh, a remaining old fashioned insult, racist insult is to say Aboriginal people are so primitive and backward that they didn't even discover the wheel, you know. Well, the reasons um, for not for the um, not having wheels, of course, is um, no huge um, scale, large scale agriculture. Because if you did have that, you'd have to have a vehicle with wheels to cart goods or produce or whatever you wanted to to a central place where it's counted, uh, sorted, counted, and recorded. So no, no um, uh, writing either. So no large scale agriculture, and those wonderful books that are out um, mentioned. Um, uh, no, um, you know, none of um, uh, none of that. Uh, about ten or twelve thousand years ago, that's when states first came in, because people started to compete over resources, compete, have wars, battles, and so on and so on. This is how a state is made, not the nation state, but the older state. And the big thing, though, there was no animals, domesticatable animals at all. No native horses, no cattle, no buffalo, Asian buffalo, um, no elephants, no camels, no transhumance animals like deer, you know, the Sami, they herd deer, thousands of them. Um, no sheep, um, no goats, no pigs. No llamas. <laughs> I think they herded them in the Latin America, South America too. So if you did, even if you could have had large scale agriculture, um, you couldn't have done that anyway. Besides just being a driest continent on earth and so on. So this this old place, I always end up saying, you know, um, not always, but when I remember it, um, we didn't invent any, you know, um, monumental architecture at all. None at all, but I think we did pretty well do a good job of inventing a um, a concept of a monumental, stable society, you know, over an immense period of time. So I'll leave it there. That is an absolutely wonderful moment to end on. So mm. thank you so much, Mary. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is we might go. I'll go straight into my. Um, response and comments just from a non-Indigenous person who's been grappling with the decolonial issues for quite a long time in my own <laughs> befuddled Western way. And I wanted to share some of that with people, but then we will come back and have discussions and an open yarn with Mary and Yin and myself. So please do stick around, but there's lots of lovely thank yous coming in. And can I please, again, I said it at the beginning, Google Yin and Mary. Um, you will find many YouTube videos. Mary has been um, speaking publicly and writing for a very long time. So please engage with their work. It will change your life. I guarantee it. It's certainly enriched and changed many aspects of mine. So Mary, um, thank you so much. Don't go anywhere. Um, normally I'd give you all a break, but I, just to stay on time, you're obviously welcome to wander off and have a cup of tea or ignore me. Um, but what I want to do is share with you the story of how um, one little white kid from the bush represents a lot of white fellas ignorance and how we've been learning and unlearning and trying to play a more positive role here on this beautiful continent. And I do find in the talks that me and Mary and Ross do together, having Indigenous and non-Indigenous views can sometimes add that extra layer of, I guess, empowerment to non-Indigenous people who often ask us, I'm not Indigenous, how can I connect to place better? I'm not Indigenous, what can I do? We are, Many of us carry the kind of the white guilt aspect too of the history of our bizarre culture um so i thought if i share some insights then we can come back and then all have a big yarn up so i hope that's all right and mary i'll take you off spotlight in case you need to get yourself a cup of tea too um yeah. and, and i'll only be about 10 15 minutes i hope so um let me just turn off your spotlight i thought i had no there we go 
So thank you so much. I'm sure for those of you who haven't heard Yin or Mary speak before, if you're feeling a profound sense of shifting in your brain, you are not alone. Every time I listen to these lovely people, I learn so much. And, and I really can't stress enough, as someone raised in the Western tradition, what a profound relief it is to be engaging with ideas that shift us away as a living entity, as an organism, as a being, um, shift us away from these heavy, heavy structures of what our globalized economy, Western legal system and all these systems have left upon us. And I think Yin spoke to that beautifully. And I'll say it again, you know, part of decolonizing is the immense joy of forgetting who we think we are. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but when we go bush, when we go outside, and when we kind of connect with nature and just have fun with each other, that's the moment when we realize we are just living entities doing our thing, trying to survive in a beautiful world. And how do we do that? Could I could I just say one yes, last thing? What, please, what, Mary. Half a minute, yeah. with, with regard to Yin Yin's um, presentation, um, how I read it, Yin um, is, uh, and I, I have said this a couple of times before, is that what it is? It's an invitation to, well, the rich West to actively actively aim for a poorer society. Actually, what, there's a term called uh, a moderate prosperity, <laughs> and um, usually it's uh, it's unheard of. Economists wouldn't. Um, wouldn't accept that at all, I don't think. Uh, well, Western the, ones anyway. The but, modern correlation, Mary, is the degrowth movement, the voluntary degrowth simplicity, yes, the frugal right, simplicity. Yeah. Um, and mm. if anyone's interested in voluntary simplicity and any of that stuff, definitely have a look at Sam Alexander's work. Um, yeah. But yeah, you're right, Mary. It's, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and they've got to start seeing it as that's the sexy yeah. way to go. And in Westerners, I've, I've spent 30 years trying to break down the barriers where Western minds have a lot of trouble taking the structures away oh and, and God, yes. seeing truth and reality. But what you do is you talk about mm. redefining the good life and we find those mm. comments. Wouldn't you love more time to have fun, to go mm. out and do things? You know, you start to break down that system. Mm. Anyway, I anyway. will do my thing and then I'll do it fairly quickly and then um, I'm really keen to have a nice big discussion. So thanks, everyone. Mm. It's mm -hmm. very, it is very humbling and difficult coming in after these two remarkable people and thinkers. Um, but just experience has shown us um, that this extra story of what um, other folks are trying to do can be of use. And I'm just battling it out with many buttons. Sorry, guys. This one should have it. All right. So I wanted to share a story with you, not just Michelle Maloney's personal story, but the work and how I came into some of the work that I'm doing with these incredible people. So that's what I'd like to share. Mm. Um, so I added after um, Yin reminded me, because I called this topic when I was setting up the workshop, decolonizing our thinking and actions. And as Yin says, our cult, uh, that to decolonize, we need a lot more than just thinking. So. Yes. so what I'm going to do is just share a quick I'm actually going to use my own personal non-Indigenous person's journey through the decolonizing that happened to me um, until I realized I then had to get involved and do it properly. Um, I'm going to very quickly talk about how I grew up in the middle of Queensland and the stuff we didn't know and the stuff we had to, to learn, engage with. Then I just want to mention two key things that can kind of float from my own personal effort and journey as a non-Indigenous person to play a more useful role in a society that I felt was very cruel. Um, and so, so just a little bit of the systemic societal work that we do, but it all blends together. It's not a, it's all very mushy um, in keeping with the idea of not being too rigid. Um, but I like to say that I grew up in a form of learned ignorance because I was born in 1970. Um, I grew up in the middle of Queensland in a little town called Barcaldon. Um, and like many, many other people, our entire primary school and high school education started History of Australia in 1788. And I find that mind boggling today and perhaps younger people listening will also find that mind boggling. It's profoundly, deeply disturbing. And I acknowledge that. But as a kid growing up in a little country town, I did not ever see that Aboriginal map of Australia we were never taught anything about Indigenous societies in school. History made us kind of roll back in our chair and roll our eyes because it was all old white men plodding through the country, starving to death and being quite miserable whilst they were looking for resources. It was not a happy subject for so many reasons. Um, and so my schooling taught me 
and enabled me to be or plead ignorance. But I was also very, very lucky because where I grew up, I grew up with Indigenous mates. We were all, it was a very interesting society because it had um, a lot of people working out on stations. My colleagues, my friends, colleagues, I was a kid, my siblings, my friends worked out on stations, black and white mucked in together. But all the elders who adopted and looked after some of the white kids who were out on stations never talked in language. They never identified as their group because they weren't allowed to. So I had friends, very close friends, boyfriend, my brother, learning from old, beautiful Indigenous men about country, where the special places were. But they never once mentioned their names or anything in language. And years later, I reflected on that as very interesting that these people <clears throat> were still on their country after horrors of driving them off. And they managed country in new ways. And I never knew any of that at the time. So I'm sure many other people can relate to this absence. And I'm not sure if our school system is any better today. I don't think it is, but our society is non-Indigenous society has slowly, slowly worked out that we haven't been learning what we need to learn. And I won't talk anything much, but when I went to ANU and I studied law and history, that's when I literally had my hair blown back from, oh my God, the history of this place. And I know that many of you will be sitting there going, oh my God, this is pathetic. I think it's pathetic. I'm embarrassed that I was 21 when I started to learn about the true history of this place. But if someone like me at 52 can tell that story, it's to tell you all, if you feel that you're ignorant, it's different today. You can Google YouTube and dig up a book. And even in my time as a kid, if, I, if I'd ever thought to do it, I would have found something, but it's different today. So this silencing of Indigenous history is profound and deliberate, and it's part of colonisation. And I just share it with you because I am still really angry about it. And um, the things that helped me, that changed my pathways were in 1995, um, <clears throat> my brother started going out with this beautiful Gungaloo woman and they got whiff of the fact that I'd just graduated from my law degree and said, Shelley, come and help us with this native title mess. And I said, I know nothing about it. What is it? And I got drawn into the Gungaloo community's battle with these massive forces of ignorance and imperialism um, in the native title processes, um, working side by side with folks. I, I wasn't paid. I was obviously just a volunteer um, trying to open doorways um, into systems that were treating everyone really poorly. And again, as an ignorant, young, middle-class white person, seeing firsthand the racism, the white supremacy, um, the threats of violence to some of our younger people, the way people treated them, but also in the community development framework, how indigenous people contributed profoundly to those local communities. We actually, back in 1996, did this big project that um, did an assessment of the value of the work that everybody in the Indigenous communities was putting into society. And we were banging on the doors of the local chambers of commerce and other white groups, showing them this remarkable body of work and all of the things that people wanted to collaborate on. It was an amazing time for me. Um, I often think about this as future dreaming number one, because years later when um, I co-founded AILA, we made sure we had an Indigenous partnerships project, because that's what you do when you're non-Indigenous. But then I you know, got in touch with Mary and others and said, let's make this an entity of its own so Indigenous people can, can lead and, um, and we can all work in solidarity. So it was only through my personal experience of engaging with communities and just falling in love with the people and the place and that the learning, the unlearning, and then um, particularly Margaret, some of the older women, they started giving me these books. And I remember lying in fetal position in my bed after reading a lot of Henry Reynolds because he was literally showing the documents, the documented histories of Townsville and other places, blatant horrors of colonial activity in places like Townsville and where I grew up and other, in the local newspaper of the day, 1890s, 1920s, 1940s, about people, you know, the way white people treated indigenous people. So I don't need to go into the horror stories. Many of us know um, that the history of colonization on this continent is vile um, in so many ways. But if you've not read anything and you don't know where to start, start with this book and then read everything you can by Indigenous authors. He's often the only um, non-Indigenous author I recommend because 
It resonates with a brain that's wondering, why didn't I know this? How is it that I grew up not knowing this? And I'm really hoping and praying that everyone under my age group has had a different experience. So that's the beginning of my little personal journey. I then um, came across something. I just wanted to share almost like a random blip vert with you. Um, for anyone who's interested in really deeply analyzing your own Western culture, critical whiteness studies, though it's from the US originally, has some very interesting theories and writing and, and um, thinkers. And I'm not sure if Yin, um, particularly in his role as a professor of race relations, could add a whole lot more. But I just wanted to read this quote from one of the many articles I've read um, to share with you a way of articulating some other aspects of decolonizing I'm not an expert in this stuff. I've just been exploring it in practice. So critical whiteness studies is a growing field of scholarship whose aim is to reveal the invisible structures that produce and reproduce white supremacy and privilege. It presumes a certain conception of racism that is connected to white supremacy. And in advancing the importance of vigilance among white people, Critical Whiteness Studies examines the meaning of white privilege and white privilege pedagogy, as well as how white privilege is connected to complicity and racism, and how white people need to learn to acknowledge rather than deny how white people are complicit in racism. And I guess my only sharing as a non-Indigenous person is I went from ignorance to horror, to shame, deep embarrassment, and I mean, my entire 20s, I was just so profoundly embarrassed that I hadn't known. And then I just got really cranky and thought, well, what can I do? What can I do to either make amends for the ancestors? I, I don't really know. I've never done my gene pool. I bet they were involved in nasty things. Maybe some of them weren't. But what can I do right here, right now, to be something other than what my ancestors have delivered to me as my fate in a colonial country? And this critical whiteness studies, I love as a white person being able to kind of peel back and state out loud that white privilege is alive and well in the Australian society and the Australian legal system and many of the systems that I have sort of committed my professional life to breaking down and understanding and doing it with compassion. I get feisty, but I do it with compassion because I know where I come from. I know the ignorance I came from rather than getting angry at someone try to take a breath in my case and go what do they know where are they up to in their learning journey what can I share with them next that might help them unpeel the stuff that I've had to unpeel so all I want to do with my remaining um, five to eight minutes or something is I actually just want to show you some of the thinking and analysis that's been helping us inside the Australian Earth Laws Alliance really rethink history and rethink the legal system um, because both Mary and Yin in their, in their lovely, wonderful, wide-ranging talks, it's an invitation to really learn and to think and to feel. But for me, my big thing is, well, what can I do about it? I know that a lot of decolonizing is not to immediately take action and do an action plan and, and fall back into the old ways, the very highly skilled administrative system that actually enabled colonialism. But what I do love is feeling that there's something I can do to make things a bit better in my lifetime. Just a tiny contribution. It's never born with hubris or grandiose, but just surely there's something more I can do. So I just wanna share with you a couple of sort of almost cobbled together snippets of things to think about and things that we've been doing. So from a legal or governance point of view, I tell the story like this when I give an earth jurisprudence talk. In 1788, this continent had a remarkable ancient governance system um, if you put it in sort of modern parlay, parlance, you'd call it a more than 60,000 years time immemorial, a local, regional, earth-centered, steady state economy governance system. But then it went through a major shift. And we had these invaders, these people, many of whom had good intentions, many of whom didn't care, many of whom were really nasty bastards. And they came to this place and they carved it up quite literally. If you look through the maps and the systems of the drawing up, um, it's, it's quite heartbreaking. The more you feel and care about the living world, the way they claimed it, they took it, they draw these lines. 
South Australia is a great example of it really being not just political empire, but it was opened up like a massive real estate deal by private corporations. The role of private corporations in empire is often forgotten as we look at monarchy and government, but the, com the sort of the blurs between the British East India Company um, the, the Royal Africa Company, the way that the, the royals and the elite of Europe controlled the rolling out and the taking of people and places and things. It's often forgotten that these were deeply supported by legal and economic systems. It wasn't just politics and power. They created the rules that everybody else was trapped inside and supported by force, which is the essence of a lot of Western law, unfortunately. And so this rolling out of the colonial project in Australia took Australia from an image, please forgive the political boundaries, an image of life in this place in 1788 to this place where the white represents profound change to the ecosystem, land clearing, um, the complete removal of native species. And you've got to ask, what were the cultural worldviews behind the people who came here if we want to decolonize our minds, exactly as Yin said, it really helps to understand the tools of what was done. Um, and very briefly, if, if you were to ask just me, Michelle Maloney, human being who's tried to learn a bit over the last 40 years, what's our task as a non-Indigenous person in Australia? For me, it's to become Australian, and that word's probably even wrong, but to love place, to take responsibility, to care for country and care for each other, and be aware of the big system stuff and try to play a role in that. So to me, I say being aware of the ongoing impacts and patterns of imperialism, empire and colonialism. Understand question breakdown and create alternatives, but work in solidarity with others to do that. None of us can do this on our own. None of us can have the knowledge on our own. It's, it's really a collective thing. And I always love when Yin challenges me, you know, what makes you think you're an individual, he asked in a webinar a week or two ago. And it was like a gentle slap in the face, like, yeah, I love it. Yeah. And if I'm not an individual, what does that make me? And how do I move forward? So earth jurisprudence is a Western framework, and I won't talk too much about it, but I like mentioning it because I figure if it resonated with me when I came across it in 2008, 2009, it can resonate with other Western brains. It gives us a cohesive framework to move from this human-centered, colonizing, extractivist way of being to trying to think more deeply about being an earth-centered human. I personally don't feel I'll ever get there. I'm just working. I'm a work in progress. But the cool thing about earth jurisprudence, and if this reference or this system of, of analysis is useful to anyone, grab it. They're all just thinking tools. Um, Thomas Berry in this book, so he's an old white deep ecologist critiquing Western stuff. And he said that if you look at the four big fundamental establishments that control human affairs, and these are just the ones he identified, law, government, economics, education, and religion. He said that these underpinning structures are all human-centered, extractivist in their mode. And by being so profoundly human-centered and elitist, they allow all kinds of harm and they actually encourage all kinds of harm to the rest of the living world and also to other kinds of peoples. So anthropocentrism is just this profound notion. It's not just, oh, humans are more important. It, if you analyze anything from the British legal system or the globalized economic system, um, really a lot of literature and a lot of thinking in the Western mode for thousands of years, it's profoundly present. Some argue it's in the Christian Bible, others say there are other interpretations. But either way, I will still say to this day, the hardest thing that I ever come across in my work is engaging with people in conversations about ecocentrism and decolonization if they come from a Western tradition it is so hard for us to unlearn what we've learned. We think certain things are vividly, tangibly real, and they're not. So it's a wonderful invitation to really challenge yourself to really get into this stuff and rethink who we are, our place in the world. So mm -hmm. Earth Laws connects my personal learning journey with a professional way of being somehow useful because it helps me critique systems in our society, but not to be a meanie and not to just be awful to folks, but to actually go, what can we do about it? I understand my history. I've moved through the shame. I accept the reality of what my people have done 
and now I want to take action and responsibility. What could that look like? It could change from month to month and year to year, but hopefully keeping on the same direction. So we're seeing earth laws, and this is just a sort of a final slide to go. The good news is, and I can bore you to death if anyone wants to join a, a summary of the history of environmentalism and environmental law in the West. Um, the remarkable thing in the last 10 years has been a rise of critiquing the very good stuff we thought was trying to do the job, environmental law. And we're seeing in Australia through the work of Mary Graham, through the work of Anne Polina, Irene Watson, so many other Indigenous lawyers, people who managed to grapple with the, the bizarre concepts in the West um, whilst holding their deep knowledge of their own law. Um, we're seeing this rise of a different way of thinking and I can't wait to see what happens next. Um, so I won't go on any longer, um, but if anyone's interested, get in touch. We've got slides. I might even do a pre-record of um, really for current day people wanting to understand why we're still destroying so much in Australia, the legal system and economic system and power structures that came here in 1788 were modified during our constitutional um, gathering in 90 and creation in 1901, but they've barely changed. All the systems are still in place. It's, it's quite profoundly disturbing. So I'm not going to go into any of that. I did want to just say that the other thing to remember is that law was used to control and is still used to, to control Aboriginal people. And we all have to play a role in decolonizing that. When Mary talks about being under the act, I know a lot of non-Indigenous people know nothing about these laws. So I've put it in red. Can you please, please Google the 1897 mm -hmm. Aboriginals Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act, Queensland. You have to know our history. Indigenous people haven't been pushed aside and, and taken off land accidentally. It has been a very systemic institutional um, political decision by people in power to make laws, to move people, to destroy their world, to steal their land. And you have to understand the history. Where to from here? <clears throat> For me, my personal journey will always flow in and out of whatever this idea of work is. I think I'm very lucky because in my early 20s, I discovered I'm obstinate, I'm obnoxious. I can't work in places I don't like. I don't want to do things I'm not interested in. I am truly a free human being in respect of doing what's important. Not everyone's like that. Sometimes we get stuck in jobs because we bloody need the money. My only advice is take your personal passions, fill up your life with them. If you have to have a small distinction for a small amount of time between how you make your money, but how you make your living, as a white fella, I urge you to do it. You will make yourself the happiest human being in the world. You are not trapped in the job that you hate you can find meaning in the day-to-day -day life that we lead, even in this bizarre Western structure. Um, and if you have the energy, if you have the time, if you have an interest, connecting into system change work, um, like many of us are trying to do, um, is something I would urge, because we need to break down the, um, the values and the systems. We need groups like Future Dreaming and AILA. We need to do what's good for the blue banded bees. So that's my talk. And it's thank you very much for listening. And now we've got a good 25 minutes for Q&A. Um, I will be making sure that um, any chats, if we've got any, um, oh, good, that's we've got someone sort of celebrating um, <laughs> blue banded bees, which is really, really good. I see a lot of wonderful comments. Um, there haven't been as many questions, but what I might do is if you've got questions now, can you please pop them in the chat? I'll start to collect them. But what I would like to do is perhaps ask Yin and Mary um, if they've got any questions for each other, because I often find that's the fun stuff. <laughs> Mary and Yin, over to you until I interrupt you with a question. Yeah, sure. Yes. Well, could, could I also say, um, Yin, I meant to say it earlier, because um, I, th you know, I thought that's brilliant all those things and how you said it so poetically. Jeez, what did you call it? Um, what do you call it um, poetically when you say, or oh, somebody said all the adverbs, is it? Yeah, something yeah, about all verbs. the adverbs. Yeah, verbs. Verbs. Yeah. Yes, yeah. wonderful. <laughs> it's terrific. I, I love it. Um, but doing all those things, it strikes me, struck me that if people just simply, you know, went along those lines, they would eventually find that, um, 
um, a conscience, a collective conscience in the country was being built because I think that's what one of the basic things at the heart of the an Aboriginal this ancient system is that they knew that that's what's got to be kind of um, um, built, managed and maintained is is uh, because when you have fascism, that means fascist fascistic things, ways of being and doing, um, that's against having a conscience. In fact, you've just killed the conscience of, of a peop of their own conscience, like a serial killer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a liquid war going on at the moment around the world, and it's increased over the years, you know, over the years. And yeah. everybody, I'm not quite sure if everybody knows this, but um, e um, e empathy is a chemical in the brain. Do you know, apparently? I didn't know this myself <laughs> until a couple of years ago. Empathy is a, a chemical in the brain. Now, now Murray's, you know, Aboriginal people mightn't have known the science of it, but they did know you have to actually keep working on it. So, so looking after land, being an environmentalist, the whole works is not just a good in itself. It is a good. It's great. It's building society, building um, relationalism and so on. But the best thing about it is in a very roundabout way, we are teaching ourselves ethics. You know, we're teaching ourselves how to have ethics, what they are, and not pursuing virtue or pursuing a moral philosophy, but because have, have, doing that and, have, and building, constructing a, a conscience among, you know, all people, everybody, um, is the way to have a stable, secure society. It's the best step, you know. You're not being good either to get a reward in heaven later because, <laughs> because there isn't any heaven, actually, in the old system, the very old system. You know, there's no God. There's no. There, there might be spirit figures who are more important than others who are God-like, but there's no Godhead character. So what it means is there's no heaven or hell. It doesn't exist. So we, we only have each other and land, you know. That's all we have. So we better start looking after each other. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of Aboriginal people have always, and trying to still do this, is to pass on a lot of these ideas to um, people, uh, to, to Australians from the very beginning. Um, um, Yin, do you know, you heard of um, uh, old, um, an old activist from New South Wales, actually, um, Mum Shirl. She died a long time ago. Mum Shirley, her name was. I don't even know what her second name was. Anyway, she was a uh, <laughs> she was the bane of your New South Wales uh, politicians. <laughs> they would try and disappear when they saw her coming. She'd tackle them in front of the Parliament House and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, <laughs> I always quote what she said. Uh, something about if only they when they'd come here, meeting us early people, early white followers, if only they explained or said what the background is, why they were kicked out of their own country, <laughs> their own land and God and so on, kicked them out. Not like the Americans who took God with them. That's why they think they're God's, God's own people now, you know. Um, but Australians have been kicked out, you see, rejected basically. Um, if they had understood this, she said, we could have worked something out because Aboriginal people are very good at looking after things and looking after people too. Very good, the experts at it. And they would have made room. They would have worked out something, you know, because they had to do that with other people who suffered um, natural crises, you know, earthquakes, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. volcanoes, uh, mm -hmm. the sea coming in and all of a sudden the land is no longer there. So they have to put up, work work in with other people. But it's a pity. Eh? But, but conscience, you have to... Australia has to start doing that, and then they will, will, everybody will get on much better. And if they followed your lines, you know, your, your guidebook, that, that, you know, they'll, they'll get there. Thank you. Mary. And do you have any responses to Mary? I've got some questions, but I'll wait. Well, I don't have much except to say that um, Mary is a wise elder and she speaks truth. If you only know how to listen. <laughs> Thanks, <you. laughs> Thanks, Ian. Hey, um, a couple of lovely questions coming in. Um, and I'm going to just sort of generalise because I'm getting a few that are similar, some privately to me, others generally in the, in the chat. So firstly, um, how, do we, how do we best share 
what the kinds of things we've just talked about, whether we call it decolonizing, whether we call it something else, into our younger generations in mainstream Australia, as well as obviously Indigenous. But I think Indigenous communities are probably more able to share stories more effectively. But Mary and Yin, what do you reckon? How do we all play a part in sharing this knowledge with young'uns? Well, do you know any young'uns? <laughs> I won't answer because Yin's talking to all of you, not just me. Yes, I do, but I, I will. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I <do. laughs> If you know young people, then talk to them. Is that simple? And what when you're parenting them, yep. please try to yep. subject them to as little institutionalized abuse as you can manage. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Very good advice. Mm. What about the school system itself, Ben? Mm. Because as obviously. Abolish it. All right. <laughs> Abolish it. Yeah. Okay, why? Tell people why because it's an institution of control and coercion and conformity that crushes the spirit, the free, creative, imaginative spirit of children. That's why. I'll, I'll probably have to say something in relation to that, love. Um, it, it could be where we part ways. <laughs> But um, mainly because uh, I'm working with the Murray School in Brisbane. I don't know if you heard of Aboriginal um, Community School up there. I'm on the board there. But, um, but also I've always believed um, that schools, if you have to have schools, um, in Australia they, they should have um, philosophy being taught in schools. I work with the philosophy department um, School of Philosophy up in um, uh, University of Queensland and so I work with people who also believe that kind of thing but philosophy in schools is a huge thing, huge thing. Some, some schools do have it actually. In Brisbane, the Buranda State School, they teach it, you know. But my idea of teaching philosophy, of course, is one thing is uh, the rites of passage, our, our own idea about the rites of passage that it isn't really a philosophy, it's a way of life, you know, it's a lived life of um, understanding um, uh, and caring for land and so on. So, so that's part of it. It's actually being um, entered into or joining the curriculum of the Murray School at, as we speak, you know, they're rolling it out. But philosophy in general um, and suitable for all different age groups, so uh, really good curriculum writers can do that because they, they the Murray kids, this is a Murray school, um, should understand exactly why, why white fellows are as they are, why European systems are as they are. They learn it in a formal way, not necessarily to like um, admire it and follow it and all that kind of stuff, but understand where the contradictions are, you know, all, all of that sort of thing. And later on, also learn about um, uh, Asian philosophy, Asian also, and the one I have myself in mind, because there's so many of them, you know, great old religions and philosophy. The one that everybody knows, of course, is Confucius, Confucian ideals, you know, because also it's not really philosophy, it's a social philosophy. You know, it's how to have a good society, basically, you know, very conservative, but I think very conservative suits Aboriginal people because you couldn't be this old as Aboriginal people without being conservative, you know. They're the last people in the world, I believe, who would ever be um, anarchic. <laughs> you can't. You have to have authority and law, law and authority, you know. Um, so they're not anarchic. But, yeah, a, um, philosophy in schools, and it, it doesn't, it wouldn't help them what to think. It would help them what thinking actually is from all these different points of view, you see, because... Australia is in this Australasian neighbourhood. They have to sooner or later stop being frightened of the or everybody to the north and learn to get on with each other, like we did from the north. You know, trade just back and forwards and so on and so on, um, and try really, really hard to. They would hopefully stand up for their own um, uh, the sovereignty that the country now nowadays has their own sovereignty. We have our own sovereignty, of course. You know, we we sort of live it or try to live it, you know, uh, and you can do that with this autonomous regard without putting down anybody else, 
you know no you don't have to don't have to you sort of you sort of pass these ideas on to australians you know and hope fingers crossed i suppose in a way it's i know it's sort of naive or weak or something i, I know it can be seen like that but um but i think you know for a country that's less than 300 years old they they have to you know somehow grab the what do you call it grab the nettle or what did they say you know and, the and realize eh? the one the the kangaroo by its ears i don't know eyes, eyes, a tail or something. <laughs> uh, and learn that they're on their own really they have to be they can't always be following um uh what you could call global hegemons for example just for once i'd love to see australia refuse to follow america into wars just huh. once you know i know you yes you'd laugh like everybody else would kill themselves laughing as if australia would ever have the courage to do that you know i know i'm, I'm sure there'd be a lot of australians who would love that the, the real issue of course is to have an australian government who can be game enough to do that <laughs> and, and of course, would, at, at the moment would, we wouldn't you know they wouldn't and i would question it. mary do we have any governments that feel they are in fact australian because you do well want yes to, if they yes. think about this continent in its reality at all in its reality they don't even understand how to live in this place and they don't really understand how lucky they are to live in this place with us in this place and near to that to the north that great huge collection of um, so, um philosophies and ways of thinking and so on they don't realize how lucky they are mm. you know i mean in 500 years or thousand years hopefully hopefully fingers crossed it might be very different by then but it's a good thing to start and they can start with all of your writings you know, you know how to do it step by step by step step lovely some really nice different opinions there about the role of education and we could talk about mm. that topic alone for a very long mm. time we've got about 10 minutes left i just wanted to put another probably two short questions and one longer one we'll see how we go for time um one lovely question i'm not sure how you'll go with this one mary and yin could you perhaps point us to good examples of other people or organizations decolonizing themselves do you can you share any ideas oh god no, in a word, <laughs> I can't think of any. <laughs> I have to be mm. honest there. <laughs> I know of people in different organisations who are trying very hard, you know. Yeah. Are there any public, are there any organisations you could publicly mention that you're either working with or are genuinely going through a process of trying to work out what this looks like for them? Anyone you can mention or maybe not yet? Specifically white ones you saw, talking about white organisations, eh? Oh, well, oh, right. yeah. Because I work with Black Card, as you know. Yes. You know, Black Card. Mm. And through your group, Black Card, or your, mm. you know, your mm. business, Black Card, you've worked with other organisations who are trying to engage with decolonising their mind. Oh, yes, yes, yes. What kind Some of, of the... things do they normally get up to once they've been thinking about that for a bit? Well, one, one, um, one big organisation, the Commonwealth Bank, the whole Commonwealth Bank, wow. how to work with Aboriginal people. Essentially, how, how to be have good manners and things like that and working with Aboriginal communities and individuals and so on, that sort of thing. They've taken on board quite a few things. Mm. Banks, you know, banks. Yeah, where do you start? But good where on you, love. Good on you, Mary. <laughs> hey, Yin, do you have any, any thoughts? Do you see anything going on that could give people hope other than us fabulous folks together today who are thinking about this? Topic? There's all sorts of things all over the world, yeah. There's, there's yeah. anyone hmm. who's involved in collectives or cooperatives uh, oh yeah hmm. autonomous sure. civil society grassroots organizations um people into hmm. holoc holocracy and other forms of distributed uh anarchic uh, decision making mm -hmm. by anarchy mm -hmm. of course i mean the politics of um people making decisions about themselves um yeah. not mm -hmm. being decided upon by government authorities so voluntary cooperation Mm. mutual aid direct action there's uh, you know there's um there's participatory democracy of various sorts all over the world you know and these this is just organizations that it's first it's a power-based approach um to power sharing mm. authoritarianism and then some yeah i guess there's some bringing in of the um the different values that underpin um cooperation and care and 
uh, compassion and empathy and those sorts of things that that's um, mm. that's mm. part of it, but it's more difficult to sort of um, to do. Uh, that all's all very hard to do with in modernity because mm. these sort of organisations are yeah marginal and marginalised. But mm -hmm. there's many thousands of them around the world. Yeah. I think many of us are all part of them, so maybe we need to embrace mm. that we are part of this system um, as mm. we're as we're kind of trying to look around for others, maybe go, oh, maybe I'm a little bit part of that. How do I connect with others? Hey, I've mm. um, got an interesting question here. Um, I sound like I'm on the radio. got an interesting question. Um, <laughs> let's talk about this. We've got, you know, we've got the princely sum of five minutes left. Um, lovely question. I'll read it all out. For many migrants, uh, if not all, the first thing they're told when um, is that they need to embrace the system's of Australian society. Because we're newly arrived as migrants, we often feel insecure. In a way, we're conditioned to not question the systems because we have to survive mm -hmm. being here. Um, you've got to get a job, get your kids to school, sort out the language, obtain a mortgage, etc. How can we also engage, um, or how can we engage migrants and to be part of this decolonizing process? And can I just, before you answer it, say, in a lot of ways, anyone who's not Aboriginal Indigenous is a migrant because my people were carted here and we met, many of us feel insecure, even if we're older, in terms of what, what year we came to this continent. So many people feel that, I guess. But yeah, Mary, Yin, Yin would you like to go first on this? Because mm. I've already got some strong views mm. on how migrants can be in part of the decolonizing, because you probably... Well, yeah, I mean, anyone can be part of decolonizing. It's, it's as a part of the chat, what Mary said at one point, it's not necessarily about beliefs and, and decolonization is about practices. It's what you do, mm, mm. how you turn up. It's how you show up. It's how you arrive. Mm. It's, it's how you depart. It's mm. how you flow. Mm. It's not about um, beliefs. And, mm. and the thing about migrants, you know, of course, Australia is, you know, got a culture of assimilation. That's, that's our, what we excel at. So, you come here, you should be grateful, blah, blah, blah. The reality is that no one needs to be grateful for the quality of prison food that they receive. Mm. We're all in the prison of modernity. There's no need to put any good reviews for the quality of cuisine, okay, or accommodation, <laughs> or whether the jail doors are squeaky or not when you open and close them. There's nothing to be grateful for to be part of the machine of destruction that is known as the global north mm. so if you come here as a migrant just forget all that bullshit and work on making the world a better place one radical localized step at a time okay i think that's beautiful Good. that that's i can handle yeah that's spot. That's spot on yeah, yeah. Well, we have two minutes left, but you know what? We have so many lovely discussion points. Why don't I say that Future Dreaming and um, in co-hosting with Ayla, we'll be hosting other conversations and discussions around these topics. Please um, engage with the materials that some of our, um, our speakers have mentioned, some materials, but do Google these lovely folks, look up their writings, their readings. You will find more and you will see references to other things and you will hopefully find other talks. Um, do what we all must do, I think, is educate ourselves, take responsibility for engaging with material. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, I think so much more we could talk about, but I might start to wrap up. What I would like to do is um, <clears throat> perhaps extend an invitation to Mary and Yin to say goodbye in however they would like to say goodbye, whether that's with some parting comments, a recipe for a, a, a chocolate biscuit you love, whatever you want to do to say goodbye to these <laughs> lovely people. And then I'll wrap up at the very end. But um, Mary, would you like to just say a fairly well to people? Well, just basically that and, and good luck. <laughs> good luck with trying to, you know, change the minds of people you know who, who you think ought to change their minds or whatever, because some very interesting stories come back about people having arguments with their family members and friends and so on and so on. So mm -hmm. good luck with everything. Yeah, thank you. And Yin? I will say to people, go forth and be eccentric and never apologise. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Never apologise. 
No, don't. I love it. Go forth and be eccentric and never yeah. apologise. Well, from me, <clears throat> what I would like to say is thank you, everyone, for being part of this conversation. Right. We had something like 350 people register for this event, which is really lovely. And oh, so many people now will watch the recordings rather than join live. I think there's a real hunger for this conversation. So let's keep mm -hmm. the conversation going. And if anyone on this call, on this call, on this meeting, wants to know more or get in touch, please email info at futuredreaming.org.au. Um, we are small and humble, but we will find ways to get back to you. Also jump on our mailing lists. You will find them on various websites. And I just want to put in the chat a final plug tomorrow. If you want to hear more from Mary, myself, and um, a gentleman called Ross Williams, join us for, I'm just putting the events page in the um, chat box for you. So futuredreaming.org.au backslash events we will be having one of our several workshops this year called connecting to place and caring for country the focus is a little more on how do we connect to place to each other um, and how do we respect and love the living world so that's on tomorrow there's lots of other things to connect with but other than that i would like to say thank you to mary and yin thank you so much for your time thank you and Everybody, do what Yin said. Go forth, be eccentric, love nature, plant something, water something, um, and have a lovely, lovely afternoon. Mm, don't apologize. <laughs> don't apologize. <laughs> All right. Thank you, lovelies. Thank Turning you. Off. Thanks. Off now. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everyone.